Um, I've listened with great interest to what's been said. You, you just mentioned me talking about Brexit. When we talked yesterday, you said we weren't going to talk about Brexit today uh, because there were other things to talk about, and I rather endorse that. I mean, my view of Brexit, very briefly, is it's an ongoing process. It's highly complex. We could spend days talking about it. We wouldn't be any clearer at the end of it. And therefore, I rather like to think of Brexit as something that is going on with very detailed negotiations. And in the end, my general view of economics throughout my long political life is that economic water finds its own level, whatever people try to do to control the way that it flows. And I think in the end, we will see Brexit achieving that too. <clears throat> but what I wanted to talk about today is why I'm here on a panel which is talking about the EU. Um, I'm here because, quite simply, we are leaving the EU, and I think there's no doubt about that, the British people have spoken, but we're not leaving Europe. And that, to me, is very essential. I'm, I'm a quarter Italian, I've got a lot major European connections. Europe is part of what I am, but that doesn't mean that the European Union is. I spent 30 years in politics talking to people across Europe who accused me as part of the British of being the problem in Europe, the people who are holding back Europe. Why did you just get out if you don't like it? Now we're told we, they want us to stay. And what I'm saying is we're staying in the crucial areas. But the crucial areas are very simple. Uh, Elizabeth Giegel was talking about defence and security. European defence and security without the positive contribution of the United Kingdom, I think would be a very poor option. For a start, we provide more than, I think it is, I think we provide more than anybody else in terms of military capability in NATO. And without the British contribution, any European security system would be severely lacking. We provide an enormous amount of shared intelligence. We have very sophisticated intelligence systems in the United Kingdom, not least in GCHQ, which are going to be vital in the future to the fight against terrorism. And those are where we will have a big role to play. And I think, too, in the, in the general area of foreign policy, Britain and Europe together, not together in the European Union, but working together, have a major role to play. Um, there's been much talk about uh, hostility during these conversations on Brexit. But to me, a future relationship without the resentment at integration and the fear of increasing bureaucracy could, in the end of the day, be much more productive. And I say to Stephen, he, he, he read out a description of my country and said, I don't recognize it. I didn't recognize it either. And I think I know why. It was a newspaper article, quite rightly, a newspaper man reads a newspaper article. But he then mentioned Boris Johnson. And I would remind him gently that Boris Johnson is more a journalist than he is a politician. And maybe that explains why I didn't recognize the description either. Um, I want to look instead at where we will be going after this. I think Richard Burt actually set us a very big challenge. He said, America is moving away. And I agree with him. And I think we, that is where we as Europeans, and I use the word Europeans, should be concentrating and looking. We need essentially to change our philosophy. As Europeans, whether it's the EU or generally, we've got to stop being also rans to the American uh, policies. We've got to start defining our own policies. Of course, we'll have common interests and so we'll work together. But in the end, we have an enormous role to play on our own. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East over the last um, 20 years, and the number of times people of all sorts in the Middle East said to me, why can't the Europeans deal with us directly? rather than always as part of the quartet and always under the American umbrella. And I feel that very strongly. I think we have a major role to play if we're prepared to disassociate ourselves, not, not completely, but in terms of the policies of reconciliation and conflict resolution from that which the Americans are pursuing. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East at the moment, Yemen, this terrible crisis in Yemen, we have a role to play. And I think it's a role which should be being played much more widely, but it's not. The United Nations has the principle of the protection of responsibility to protect. And I look at what's happening in Yemen at the moment, where thousands of people are dying, many more than would have died in Libya had we not gone in. And where is, where is the responsibility to protect? Why aren't we as Europeans trying to deliver that, to say that we can actually salvage something from this mess? And when you look again at what's happening in the, the general Sunni-Shia conflict. 
Uh, we are still, because we are under the ambit of the United States, so I may say so, we're still taking sides. Now, you do not resolve conflicts like that by taking sides. You have to, I once used the analogy that if you want to referee a game, you, you, you have to be open to both sides. If you take one side, you're cheering from the sidelines. And I think that's a very important element of where we as Europeans could be playing a genuine role in terms of what could be the biggest conflict of our lifetimes in the future. And the last one is what we hear about all the time, North Korea. We hear of the dangers. But you know, uh, we hear the rhetoric. I heard more rhetoric this morning. Little Rocket Man is now being conflicted by Big Rocket Man, if I may say so. And we're getting nowhere except the situation is getting more and more dangerous. We should be able to say, first of all, this is not a fight in which we have a dog. And therefore, we're not going to get involved directly in what is happening at the moment. But if it comes to conflict, we have a major interest. Because the, uh, the results of that conflict could impact upon us all. And we need to be thinking very carefully about how Europe can position itself to make sure that that conflict is less likely rather than more likely. And there is one other element I just want to mention because it's an old uh, canard of mine. If we are going to play a real role in achieving reconciliation and peace in the world, we have to change the United Nations Security Council. You cannot have a world order that is governed by people who are selected on the basis of the uh, situation at the end of the last world war and where one country has a veto and can stop any sensible decision being taken forward. Now that's a major challenge, but we in Europe should be playing a major role in trying to move towards that. And then finally, I want to look at where we go next in the world. Um, there are new opportunities. I think uh, Richard Burt said this. New opportunities for the EU and the UK in the world. And what I see is that, I used to be a historian, that the smooth flow of history is often interrupted by periods of substantial change. And that politicians who naturally react to that by saying, we mustn't allow our, our comfortable positions to be interrupted, resist that. But in the end, change happens. And if we are going to be genuinely constructive, we have to accept that change, and we have to work with it. Uh, the, other t the integration of the EU, which is what uh, President Macron has talked about, may, may be an essential part of that change. But it has to be the right sort of change. It can't just be returning to the rigid structures of the EU. It has to be an EU with a new vision. And that vision is still, I have to say, lacking. One of the keys to the change we're seeing around us in the world at the moment is the growth of anti-establishment feeling. You look at all these political results, there's one common factor, and that is that people are voting against the establishment. And we have to say to ourselves, why is that? It's not just particularly amongst the young. Really the reason is that all these people who are anti-establishment are fed up with the old order. It's not enough for us to say, leave it to us, normal order will be resumed as soon as possible, as they used to say on television. People don't want normal order to be resumed. They want change. And that change has to come through ideas and vision. And that is what, at the moment, our world is lacking. And I see in Europe the real vibrancy that can create that vision for the future. We had a, a playwright who wrote many years ago these words, which were quoted, I think, by Bob Kennedy in, many years ago in America. Some men see things that are and ask why. I dream of things that have not been and ask why not. And I think it's time that Europe started asking why not. Thank you so much uh, to Michael Lothian, former uh, UK member of uh, the Parliament. Interesting enough, uh, ending with a quote by Robert Kennedy and not Winston Churchill, uh, as I think it's always fitting uh, for a UK man. But um, I think it's very interesting what you pointed out, namely that Great Britain is leaving the European Union, but not Europe per se. Now, that, of course, is an important message. We will see how that plays out in uh, reality, in a sense, uh, interestingly enough, pointing out that perhaps, Stephen, Europe should be grateful for Brexit because now the UK is no longer holding the process of unification, true unification, uh, uphold. But if I understood you correctly, to dash any hopes is the British people have spoken and Brexit is final. This is what I heard you say. So for all of you 
not just on the panel, but in the audience, hoping for a reverse coming from Michael Lothian. That's not going to happen.